Greetings. I'm Erica James, Dean of the Wharton School. Thank you so much for joining us. An expansion of the Tarnapol Lecture Series, Beyond Business, is an ongoing conversation that explores the most complex and pressing issues impacting individuals and organizations around the world. This year's three-part series shines a light on how firms can improve on environmental, social, and governance criteria to drive positive change. Our first event in October focused on tackling the climate crisis. Tonight's event looks at how boards can redefine corporate governance to maximize a company's social impact while balancing the needs of all stakeholders. Our final event in December will address the topic of humanizing ESG and how firms can be a positive force in addressing social challenges. Joining me in our conversation today are three superstars. Mary Hunter, or May McDonnell, is an Associate Professor of Management at Wharton. Luke Taylor is also an Associate Professor of Finance at Wharton. And Brian Stafford is a Wharton graduate from 1999 and is Chief Executive Officer of Diligent Corporation, the largest governance, risk, compliance, and ESG software provider. Our conversation today will begin with May, Luke, and Brian, and will be followed by an audience Q&A. I encourage you to please, throughout this session, submit questions through the chat fe feature, and we will get to them towards the last half of the hour. So thank you all for joining me today. May, I want to start with you. One of the areas of research that I was engaged in actively as a faculty member before assuming the deanship at the Wharton School was in the field of crisis management and in particular crisis leadership. So this is something that has gained considerable attention uh, in the era of the pandemic, knowing that we have all to some form or fashion had to have become crisis managers. Tell us more from your perspective how boards are being affected by crises such as the COVID pandemic and the social unrest we've seen in recent times. And what are they doing in response to this era? Thank you for such a great question to kick things off. Um, a really interesting thing to think through. And it's a, really it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I think it's important to start by noting that boards have always been heavily shaped by crises. And so boards tend to, their, their attention and the attention to, to reconfiguring boards tends to always be uh, guided by what crises are front and center at the moment, most salient to executives at the moment. So prior to, to what we've gone through in the latest um, few years, uh, the last set of crises that really shook up corporate governance were the accounting scandals in the early 2000s, that, that the, the scandals that sunk Enron and WorldCom. And those scandals exposed major weaknesses in uh, board monitoring and oversight mechanisms. And so what boards did to respond to those crises was focus much more heavily on independence and, and arm's length monitoring capacity of boards and on strengthening and deepening the financial acumen of new directors. And you can see that clearly if you look at the skill sets of the cohort of directors that were brought onto boards in the mid 2000s uh, to the mid 2010s, which prioritized people that had experience in auditing or deep financial acumen, such as CFOs or uh, individuals that were coming from the financial sector. So this latest set of crises that, again, we're seeing shake up the boardroom, um, COVID, social and political unrest, but also a, you know, technological disruption that is rapidly shaking up organizations. Uh, it's exposing another major weakness in corporate governance today by highlighting that many boards are not equipped to offer strategic guidance on these kinds of non-market crises that arguably carry the most enterprise risk for firms today. And again, I think that the way that firms are adjusting is by adjusting the profiles of directors that they're onboarding. Uh, and you can see this if you look at the, the backgrounds and um, capabilities on, uh, within the cohort of directors that have taken their seat in the last five years as exposed to that older set of directors. Um, for example, we're seeing many more directors coming onto boards today with experience in social responsibility or socially responsible investing. Uh, experience in human resources 
human resources is really prized on boards today. And also we're seeing much more uh, depth and technological experience on uh, incoming board members. And so this, this shift is equipping boards to better understand and guide firms through uh, the more turbulent social and political environments that, that firms uh, are navigating today. But the shift speaks directly to the kind of uh, crises that are front and center at the moment. And just to follow on with that, May, is it your experience historically that as the needs and, and circumstances of a community of a society of the of industries are shifting that we see those kinds of movements in board profiles I, I to the extent that that it affects um, long-term value and long-term strategy I think that's true I think that boards are always trying to shift to to fill the proverbial holes in the dam that they see as as presenting the most risk to ongoing performance Great, thank you. So, Brian, I want to ask you, what are some of the best practices for boards to increase their resilience in troubling times like what we're experiencing now? Yeah, we, we um, I think anybody who sits on a board, um, uh, Dean James, I know you sit on a board as well. Um, I think what most boards found was they were just in it, <laughs> spending way more time with their companies. I think best practices in turbulent times is communication, communication, and communication. And that has on three different levels. One, um, I think getting in and spending more time with the company and with management, trying to understand and getting a sense for, you know, real time and in crisis mode. Um, what are the issues the company are dealing with? How many of the issues are impacting long-term strategy? How many of the issues are impacting near-term liquidity and crises? And so we found a lot of board members just lean in and where they had expertise, kind of dive in much more directly with management and actually help management on all the issues kind of at, at hand. Um, second, we found board members materially increase their level of networking. So it wasn't just connecting with the company, but it was also connecting individually with other board members, just to try to understand how other people were, um, uh, were reacting quickly and helping their companies. Um, and the third one, which ties to it, is just constantly learning finding out what things that boards can do to adapt from the crisis to ultimately um, help their um, help their companies. And I think the companies that we, we saw respond most quickly, either on liquidity issues or um, on some of the social crises or, you know, issues around just compensation for employees in industries where, um, uh, where the industry and such a travel kind of went away. I think the companies who responded fast uh, and the boards who helped management are the ones that were the most um, uh, resilient and upheld, upheld their reputation in uh, what's been a difficult two years for, uh, for many companies. Thank you. And I'm also curious, do boards and management teams have to think differently about the balance of responsibility that a board might have so that you want to be careful that, you know, boards aren't getting too in the weeds and, and, and taking too much responsibility for managerial roles, but at the same time, when a company is in crisis, you actually need more engagement by the board. Is Yeah, uh, the boards that we talked to, the boards for our clients, it was kind of a bit of the all bets are off. <laughs> it mm -hmm. depends on how bad things are. And as things were worse, where you have specific expertise from your board, I think you saw management asking for that help. And you saw boards um, kind of breaking that wall between <laughs> governance and management leaning in to help out. I think we all find that in any crisis, that's kind of what you do. <laughs> you just roll up your sleeves and dive in. And so some much more of that happened um, over the course of the last couple of years than it happened before. In many boards, though, you have seen folks pull back um, uh, as companies got more stabilized, use what they learn as ways to coach the CEO and potentially the team on areas that might be gaps across the leadership team and areas that they need to lean in and supplement kind of to one of the points that May brought up and make sure you can add other other components to your team to make sure your your team can weather um, new challenges and future crises. Yeah, thank you. So Luke, I want to bring you into this conversation and have you describe for us what we really mean by governance in today's ESG conversation and how has the notion of governance evolved over the time, uh, over a period of time? Is there anything that you can share with us from a shareholder perspective around that? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I love this question. Uh, it, it's amazing how much governance has, has changed. And I'm going to take a, a very long view of this. Um, 
think back 50 years. Think back to you know the year 1970, when you know the famous economist Milton Friedman writes this essay. Um, that's now famous. In, in this essay, he argues that uh, the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, basically to maximize shareholder value. So, I mean, this was the idea of shareholder primacy. This is the idea that corporations exist mainly to serve their shareholders. And I think Milton Friedman's idea had a, had a huge impact on how companies are run. Uh, it had a huge, Im huge impact on corporate law, it had big impacts on uh, even at the asset management industry. But I think Friedman's idea came under attack almost since the day that it, that it came out. If you fast forward to, say, the year 2019, in 20, 2019, we saw the Business Roundtable release a new statement about the purpose of a corporation. And this was signed by 181 of the world's top executives. And in their new statement, they said companies should be led for, for the benefit of all stakeholders, not just shareholders, uh, but also customers, employees, um, suppliers, the community, the environment. So I do think we've seen a huge shift since Milton Friedman's essay, and I think consistent with that shift. Um, today, if you look at, you know, in the United States, shareholder proposals, the majority of these shareholder proposals are about ESG issues. So what does this word governance mean in today's conversation? Well, I'll give you my, my personal view. My view is that uh, companies should not be maximizing shareholder value. Instead, I think they should be maximizing shareholder welfare. And there's a difference there because shareholders care about more than just profits. For example, shareholders care about treating employees well, or they care about cleaning up the environment, right? So you can imagine like cases where you have win-wins, where what's good for say the environment is what's good for profits. But I think more often you have trade-offs, but you can imagine cases where shareholders would say, look, I'm willing to, to sacrifice some of our profits in order to do the right thing for society or the right thing for the environment. Um, and by the way, I think this new view, it's, it's perfectly consistent with the idea of shareholder primacy. Right? It just recognizes that shareholders care about more than just profits. So, so to me, what is governance today? To me, governance means the various ways that we get a firm to maximize shareholder welfare, which is different from, from maximizing shareholder value. And how does governance look? Well, you know, my favorite recent example is, is about engine number one. Um, I know David Swift, Swift from engine number one was like a recent uh, uh, a version of the series. And, it's amazing what they did. It was this tiny, uh, I'll, I'll say a small hedge fund that acquired a tiny stake in Exxon. And their goal was to move Exxon away from fossil fuels. And they managed to run this activist campaign and ultimately win three seats on the board. So um, um, that, that's kind of how I see governance today and how I've seen its change. Thank you for sharing that perspective. And May, would you add anything to what Luke has just described? Yeah, that Luke's answer really resonated with me. I um, I first became um, interested in corporate governance when I was a law student, and so this was 15 years ago now at um, Harvard Law School, and I was you know taking an initial elective class on on corporate governance and the framework for corporate governance that all of the law students were being given at the time was very much this Friedman esque a treatment of the subject. So I even jotted down the the um, the definition of corporate governance that was in my 1L syllabus. It's the set of mechanisms that induce the self-interested controllers of the company to make decisions that maximize the value of the company to its owners. And so this just reeks of, you know, this agency theory perspective and governance, the governance system is almost adversarial when you when you cast it in this way vis-a-vis -vis managers the board is like a policeman that is being brought in to watch managers and keep their potential digressions uh, from the shareholders best interest in check uh, and i think with esg what is happening is a tremendous um recasting of what corporate governance means where it is now 
being looked at more broadly as the full set of mechanisms that a firm can use to align the interests of its decision makers with those of its key stakeholders. And so we're broadening not only the types of stakeholders that should have a voice in this process um, beyond shareholders alone, but also we're broadening the types of performance that matter, the types of performance that the board should be helping the, the company to achieve. Um, and you know, so we can we can pursue um, uh, a true pro-social impact as well as just uh, market outperformance. And so within this reframing, I think that the board's role is moved toward more of a team model of leadership, and they're supposed to work more alongside managers instead of necessarily policing them. And they act as something like a, a neutral umpire who is who's tasked with understanding the interests of all stakeholders involved uh, and contributing to sustainable corporate performance. And so within that recasting, I think the attributes of governance that are most prioritized from the perspective of the ESG discussion are those that are focused on making sure that the right people and structures are in place to be sure that the board can fully understand the interests of all stakeholders as, as an umpire that really understands the rules of the game being played before it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a big part of the reason that uh, diversity inclusion is front and center in the ESG governance conversation today, as well as uh, things like uh, whistleblowing procedures and uh, the, the board's compliance reviews of the company's political activity, as well as, you know, bribery and corruption activities that speak to the firm's uh, impact on policy, as well as on, on markets, per se. Great. Lot, lots to discuss here. Brian, I want to bring you into this conversation as well. From your vantage point and within Diligent, what kind of complexities are you seeing boards struggle with today that they didn't have to contend with in the past? Uh, sure, I'll give you two issues. Um, one, which I think was pre-pandemic, but accelerated during the pandemic. And then second is a new one. And the one that was, I think, a big issue for boards pre-pandemic and accelerated was cyber risk. And what we saw was cyber risk. And for the first time ever, DNO insurance, a so director and officer insurance, um, your, your DNO insurance could be pierced if you actually, as a board, weren't um, were negligent on cyber risk and cyber um, policy. And so what you had was an increase in attacks of companies and a board member historically was able to say, I'm just not aware of the risks to now all the large insurance companies saying that it's part of your job as part of a steward of the company to actually help to get deeper on that risk. And so cyber risk was something that we saw just increasing and um, get even more um, uh, the attacks just step up in frequency as we all move to a model of where we, um, we work from home. Um, but the bigger issue that, that um, your other panelists talked about um, is ESG. Um, so we work with over 750,000 board members globally use our applications. And the single most frequently asked question that I get from our board members is, what should we be doing about ESG? And just to take a step back, it's a very broad and thin question um, that, that is asked, to be honest. Um, uh, there's different levels of depth in different places. But broadly speaking, it is what should we as a board and thus how should we advise, steer our companies around the areas of ESG? And I think it's it's an area where, um, and we did some research looking back at Sarbanes-Oxley to kind of May's earlier point, or even um, uh, GDPR and other issues that have come up and been large scale issues within the board and then areas like ESG. And we looked at actually media sentiment at the time of each of these issues coming back, taking each issue to kind of a T equals zero. And you actually saw GDPR having twice as many um, uh, uh, press release or press comments at the time it came out, mentions in the media, et cetera, um, versus uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. And then if you look at ESG comparatively, it was 4X, 4X what you saw from GDPR. And so just the, you know, and I would argue it's still building. and. Um, part of the reason why that we get all the questions about it is um, it is a bit amorphous. <laughs> um, the E is very different than the S, is very different than the G. It is an umbrella that fits over everything, and it requires um, companies having real um, questions or policy around it. And the question of whether 
do we believe this persists or do we believe this is, you know, yet another thing that we as an organization or companies care about? And then it kind of goes to the wayside. The thing that I think that that will allow ESG just to have to persist and have legs or it has three or four factors that drive it. Um, we all talked about the um, uh, the push from investors. We talked about engine number one, et cetera, and investors just caring about it, and whether that's engine number one, whether that's State Street or BlackRock, et cetera. We also have government, impending government um, regulation, whether everybody expects TCFD to get passed in the next year by the SEC and that requirement. Um, but the two other factors that I think will drive more persistent is employees care about it. Like our team at Diligent really, really cares the fact that they actually work at a company that cares about having some impact and making the world better. And we all know as consumers, we actually care about buying products from, buying services from um, organizations that share our values. And I think those three, but kind of four um, mega points, I think will cause ESG to be a question that just keeps getting raised within the boardroom. And we'll see public companies disclose, but we also see it from all of our private equity clients. Um, all the private equity LPs demand that that their um, GPs actually take a stand on ESG at some level. Um, I think the Northern European um, uh, pension funds and other places care more, but you'll see that grow. And so I don't think it's only a public company phenomenon, but I actually think it's hitting much of much of the private um, uh, middle market economy as well. Yeah, thank you for that perspective. I, I actually want to change directions a little bit and talk about something that every so often surfaces in the media and, and headlines, and that is executive compensation. So one of the salient issues that boards grapple with is the compensation of their CEOs and their senior leadership teams. Why has this become such a hot button topic? And, and Brian, I'm gonna go right back to you. Um, what, you know, how do boards correct or address any kind of pay inequity? Or the gap well, between a lot of, a lot of CEO pay. Yeah. Please yeah, there's ahead. a lot of places to hit on the, the concept of, of compensation and how it ties to the board. Um, I think it also um, it ties back to the, the conversation around what are you trying to maximize? Are you trying to maximize the value for your stakeholders or are you trying to maximize the value for your shareholders? And as you all know, um, compensation historically was tied to the value um, played back to shareholders. and you know, TRS, um, uh, total return to shareholders and kind of most compensation tied to that. But now to your point, um, Dean James, I think you're seeing many other elements of compensation tied to broader stakeholders and whether it's tied to uh, diversity and inclusion of the management team and or board, um, whether it's tied to other targets such as sustainability of a company and kind of how you can manage for the longer term. I think you're seeing those things. Um, uh, uh, you'll see more and more pay tied to other non-financial metrics over time. We're seeing it in certain industries. We talked about energy, um, but you'll see it in consumer goods and other places. And I think we're just at the cusp of that, of pay policies getting <laughs> infinitely more complicated for boards to manage, for shareholders to understand, and then for management teams to make sure they can build plans to, to hit them and make sure they can um, uh, drive to those targets that influence performance. Thank you. And May, I know this is an area that you also have some perspective on. You know, how do you think about what boards can and should be doing with respect to pay inequities uh, within their organizations? Yeah, I think that, that um, first, first, it's useful for boards to really understand why uh, pay inequity matters. Uh, what the literature suggests at present is that um, is that what we should be paying attention to is, is basically the, the difference between the extent to which an executive's pay is going up and the extent to which a, a you know, average worker in the firm is uh, their compensation is going up. And the reason that we're seeing pay skyrocket um, so much in the United States is because we've bought into this pay for performance compensation model where we want it, we want CEOs to have skin in the game and to be you know, properly motivated to, to outperform. And so we tie compensation to these aspirational market prices. And then when they fit, when they, when they meet those market prices, their, their pay goes up. So CEO's actual uh, total compensation is, is really tightly correlated to the index performance where their company's listed. The problem is that we, we don't attach every other worker's pay to performance. And so it suggests that, you know, a CEO should get more credit for, 
uh, continued outperformance than all of the other people that contribute to a firm's success on the on the day to day. And we don't see workers within companies enjoying the same uh, types of pay increases, uh, even in the face of good uh, corporate performance as the CEO. And so this leads to real disparities between the CEO and, and lower level um, employees. And those disparities cause all kinds of uh, uh, harms, operational harms within firms, but also societal harms. So pay inequality inside a firm has been linked to lower worker morale, lower worker output and attendance, uh, lower uh, cooperation within uh, internal teams. Um, and then pay inequality as a broader societal issue is really tightly correlated with underinvestment in collective goods like public education and infrastructure and uh, higher crime rates. And so we, we do need to pay attention to kind of the broader social effects and psychological effects of um, having a, a pay that is, that is enjoyed by only the people at the, the, the tippy top elite tier of the organizations that they're leading and not by everyone else that contributes to a firm's performance as a going concern. Yeah. And while we're on this topic of, of CEO compensation, what do you think, May, about tying CEO comp to ESG performance? And are there implications for that? Yeah, I think it is one of the most exciting potential tools that firms could use to, if they are truly committed to ESG performance over the long term. Um, everybody says in order to, to change culture, you start with incentives, right? And so if you really want to steer uh, uh, executives to care about ESG matters, it's a wonderful way to do it. Uh, and there's some firms that are, there's roughly a, a approaching half of the S&P 500 today uh, uses some measure of pay for social or environmental performance. And there's some firms like Freeport McMorrin had 25% of their annual incentive plan uh, based on uh, the, the achievement of, of uh, safety, environmental, and social goals. So some firms are really taking this seriously. Um, I think that too many firms are still treating ESG performance um, uh, incentives as, as something like a bonus instead of attaching them to longer term uh, ESG aspirational targets, which is what I think would actually move the needle more in terms of a true performance. But the research that we have on this on these pay for performance metrics suggests that they they work. There's a great paper uh, by a good friend of mine, Caroline Flammer, that shows that um, uh, pay for pay for environmental performance metrics are associated with a 3.1 percent increase in, in performance in terms of Tobin's Q, increased uh, ESG metric scores by five percent. Uh, and emissions decreases of 8.7%. So those are real, real changes that are happening when these when these incentives are introduced. Excellent. All right, Luke, let's bring you back in. And I want to talk about motives and investing motives around ESG. So investor interest in ESG has clearly increased in recent times. What do you expect will be the trends for ESG investing and returns going forward? Sure. Let let me start with the ESG returns, because this is, this is an area where I've been doing a lot of research lately. Um, I'll tell you what I've learned recently about ESG returns, and then we'll talk about kind of what that means for boards and what that means for executives. So, so with my co-authors, I've been studying the past trends in ESG returns, and we've been asking what do those past trends imply about the future performance of ESG investing strategies? Basically, the punchline of our research is that ESG investing strategies have performed well in the past, but we should not expect them to perform well in the future. And this relates to what you brought up about, about the motives of the ESG investors. When you ask uh, investors why they do ESG investing, we have various surveys in which we do that. And uh, you know what investors typically say is, one of their top two reasons for doing ESG investing is to get higher returns. And when you ask asset managers, you know, should we expect high returns from ESG strategies? They, they also say, yes, we expect high returns from ESG strategies. My research says the opposite. We, we should not expect 
high returns from ESG strategies. Um, and we have two reasons for saying that. The first is just appealing to, to economic logic. We've got a lot of ESG investors out there. They like holding, I'll call them green stocks, ESG friendly stocks. That demand makes those green stocks expensive today. They have high prices today. So that means those same stocks, they have lower expected future returns. Um, their price is already high. It just doesn't have that much room to grow in the future. So that's the first reason we say we should not expect high returns from ESG. The second reason we say that is just by looking at the data. We look at the E part of ESG. We look at environment. And we just look at a simple investing strategy where you just buy the environmentally friendly stocks and you short the environmentally unfriendly stocks. That, I'll call it a green strategy, that strategy has performed incredibly well over the last eight years. Should that outperformance lead us to expect more outperformance going forward? Well, we find the answer is no. We find that those past returns were unexpected. They were due to unanticipated increases in concern about climate change. So first thing we do is we show that you know, to none of our surprises, I hope, we've become a lot more concerned about climate change over the last eight years. And then next we show that bad news about the climate, it tends to be good news for the returns of green stocks. And then we do kind of a what if analysis. We say, you know, what if the last eight years had been different? What if, what if we had not seen these huge increases in concern about climate change? We can, add, we can do that with like a very simple statistical analysis. And what we find is that the outperformance of these green stocks disappears if there had been none of these increases in concern about climate change. So that, that's why we say this outperformance was unexpected. So, you know, how does this affect boards? It affects boards in two ways. So, you know, the first thing our research says is that if a company can just make itself a little greener, more ESG friendly, that's going to help the company's stock price. Okay. So all companies, green companies, not green companies, all companies have this incentive to become a little bit greener. Um, and the second way it affects boards is through the cost of capital. What our research says is that this, this rise of ESG investing has changed companies cost of capital. It's made capital cheaper for green companies. It's made capital more expensive for non-green companies. So if you're on the board of directors for, let's say, a solar energy company, you should be saying, capital has become a lot cheaper. I should go raise some of this cheap capital, and I should use that to, to build more solar farms. You know, if instead you're on the board of, a, let's say, a, a non-green firm, like a, a coal company, well, you should be saying, capital has become a lot more expensive for us because we're not ESG friendly. And maybe we shouldn't be out raising expensive capital. Maybe we shouldn't be digging more coal mines. Um, so I think the end result here is actually great news for, for society and for the environment, because we should be seeing all companies becoming greener simply out of a desire to increase their share price. And we should be seeing capital reallocated away from non-green firms and toward uh, green firms. We should see less coal mines. We should be seeing... Uh, uh, more solar farms, thanks to the rise of ESG investing. There's so much fodder that you all are providing with your responses, and I know that you're whetting the appetites of our of our audience. So I just want to remind folks that please uh, put your questions into the chat feature. We're going to be moving to the Q&A section in just a few minutes. So, May, I'm going to come back to you and, and really want to focus in on board diversity, which, as you know, is also a prominent topic in the aspect of ESG. What, uh, the recent studies show noticeable gains in the diversity of boards for a variety of reasons. How are these changes impacting board performance? Yeah, I think, um, so in general, there the the link between board diversity and performance is a tremendous part of why we see so many institutional investors in particular being vocal advocates of board diversity and even threatening to start withholding votes from companies that aren't making progress on embracing uh, board diversity and there are some studies that link um 
that link diversity to superior performance. Uh, there's work showing that more diverse boards um, achieve superior return on sales and ROE. They experience lower stock price volatility. There's less incidence of uh, bribery and fraud. And, and there's a number of studies that suggest that in general, more diverse boards uh, are better ESG performers and, and increase their performance in ESG areas over time uh, more quickly. I think that the, the you know, one caveat to the research is that we don't have a perfect experiment here. We haven't been able to you know, randomly assign boards different levels of diversity so that we could show the causal relationship between board diversity and these metrics of performance. And there are, you know, frankly, pretty straightforward reasons to think that other there could be other variables driving that connection. So a firm that really cares about ESG issues is also going to care about diversity and potentially move more quickly toward embracing a, a diverse board. That said, I do think if you look at the team's literature in general, there's really good evidence to speak to what might be uh, contributing to a causal relationship between a uh, board diversity and um, and outperformance and and board and board uh, decision making quality in general. Uh, so in the team's literature, what what the research suggests is that diversity improves the quality and accuracy of team's decision making. Uh, and the, the idea is if you walk into a team and everyone has a similar you know, background as you, then you're going to assume that everybody understands the issues similar to the way you do. And, and, and you, you assume it'll be kind of an easy, easy to sell your point of view. But when you walk into a room where everyone has a different background than you, then you know that you might have to do some convincing. You might meet some people that see the situation a little differently than you. And so you prepare more before the meeting, you deliberate more during the meeting. And because of that deeper deliberation, factual inaccuracies are more likely to, to surface and you know, potential pitfalls are more likely to be discussed. And so diversity is improving the performance of every team member uh, when you introduce it into a team. And I think that, that that's absolutely part of what's going on uh, in, in linking board diversity to the quality of boards decision makers, because you're really, you're expanding that diversity of thought in the room uh, and you're making the board, you know, prepare harder and deliberate harder around the hard issues. Yeah, thank you. Again, I could just go on and on with so many of these, these questions because every response that's provided just elicits uh, a follow-up that, unfortunately, I don't have time to engage in. But, Brian, I do want to ask you a question around board diversity. How are firms working to be more transparent regarding board diversity? And is this becoming baked into their strategy? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really good question. I think um, just about every board out there is having a conversation around diversity or it's part of an ongoing conversation they've been having for a while. Um, and there are a few factors that drive it. Um, I think one of the um, one of the important factors is regulation. If we look at regulation or, or market-based control, uh, May talked a little bit about um, the way investors think about investing in companies who have diverse leadership teams or specifically diverse boards. But you're also seeing um, uh, the law in California around a minimum number of, of women on boards. You're seeing NASDAQ's um, policy, uh, they got approval from the SEC around requiring a certain minimum number of, uh, of, of diverse or underrepresented minorities on their board, or at least disclosing specifically why you might not have been able to meet that criteria. So you're seeing the, the um, uh, regulatory um, pressure, you're seeing the investor pressure, but I think also one of the things uh, that is really driving the conversation around being transparent around it is actually the employee base and the team. I think whether it's driven by some of the areas of social unrest that have happened in the US over the last couple of years, you find more and more millennial employees and people are asking questions that says, why does our board not look like either our team? <laughs> or why does our board not look like our customer base? And I think it's pretty difficult <laughs> for a board um, to argue why, um, why the makeup of a board shouldn't be more representative of either the people who work there or your customer base, because whether it's diverse opinions or people coming from different places, I think that ends up being highly logical. And you're seeing boards increasingly, it differs by industry, being asked tough questions by, um, by their employees that um, companies are equally, are increasingly having to respond to 
in part because um, just how um, how much um, the war for talent just of employees have just continued to rise over the last few years. So, so yes, you're finding way, way, way more transparency than I think we've seen on multiple levels um, over the course of the last three, four years. So we've been talking about board diversity, and one of the things that has happened pretty predominantly post-2020 is that companies have been more engaged in the political landscape and needing to communicate uh, around political matters that companies may not have waded into in the past. So, Brian, I want to stick with you for just a minute. What are some of the measures that boards uh, can take to ensure or to think strategically about how to manage their firm's political and social activities uh, and in the context of the social environment that we find ourselves in at this moment? Yeah, I'd say there's two components I'll comment on. Um, the first one is I think you saw a lot of boards being caught a little bit flat-footed um, from not understanding where their companies were, um, uh, were contributing and to what cause with different um, uh, political parties. And so we found a lot of boards just requiring transparency and saying, where are we donating, why, and comparing it to, um, to the values of the company or the stated values of the company and the CEO. So that, that's kind of, I, I think, one thing that has caught companies flat-footed. The one thing that is an interesting juxtaposition is, is we're seeing more and more of the CEO as the statesman. <laughs> there used to be a view of where the CEO was supposed to just focus on doing the job. <laughs> And what we found, I think, increasingly over the last two or three years, whether it's because of a um, maybe a lack of leadership in government globally um, or employees requiring more, setting a higher bar for leadership. But you've seen boards wanting more transparency around um, what a company is doing politically, but also increasingly being open to and supportive of CEOs who um, who speak out and have a perspective, have a perspective around things that they find matter. Um, kind of within the realm of as long as that stands with company values, where you've seen boards have to step in or attempt to step in is where there's a divergence between the two. And, and then boards have to pull out ultimately their trump card, which is, um, you know, they decided, um, you know, when to hire or fire the CEO. And I think it's an interesting environment that boards have had to weigh in on in a way that they probably haven't over the last two or three years or beyond the last two or three years. Well, I know our audience has a number of questions, so I want to go ahead and move to the Q&A at this point. And Luke, it looks like our, our first question actually is for you. How exactly can ESG investors create positive social impact? And are there specific steps that they can take to be more influential in this regard? Sure. They, um, it's a great question. How, how can ESG investors have actual impact? I, I can think of I can think of three ways, at least three ways. Um, the first is through engagement. Okay, uh, the idea is you you buy a stake in a company, and you directly engage with the management team to achieve whatever your um, ESG goals happen to be. I, the prime example of that again would be engine number one, buying a stake in Exa, uh, Exxon and um, and and advocating for 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 climate policy. Um, so that's one engagement. I think that the second channel would be by by inducing all companies to become greener. Um, the evidence suggests that you can make your stock price higher by making your company greener, and that's that that's true if you're already pretty green. It's it's even true if you're you're the Exxon's of the world. Um, so basically, ESG investing can have impact by creating this incentive for every company to become even more ESG friendly. It's a case where doing the right thing for ESG happens to also be the right thing for making your stock price higher. So that's number two, every company becoming greener. The third way would be um, ESG investors can have impact by by essentially causing capital to be reallocated in our company. And it goes back to what I was saying about, about uh, cost of capital. The rise of ESG investing has changed companies' cost of capital. It's made co capital cheaper for, for ESG-friendly companies and vice versa for the, the unfriendly companies. And again, this means that you're going to have impact by inducing the ESG-friendly companies to expand their operations 
you're also going to have impact by inducing the ESG unfriendly companies to possibly uh, shrink their operations. So hopefully the end outcome is, you know, we see, for example, more solar farms and, and fewer coal mines, like I said earlier. Thanks. I actually have a quick follow up on that. Um, we, we're talking about the role of the investor, but is there a role of the consumer in all of this? Uh, for example, part of the the challenge is consumers are still utilizing products that are not U that are not ESG friendly, if you will. And and so, how do investors think about the demand from the consumer side for these companies' products, while also recognizing that there's a an opportunity and a need to sort of shift towards more uh, ESG promotion related activities. Sure, is that for me for me as well? Yeah, I'll, yeah. Sorry, Luke. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. If you're sitting on a board, um, you need to be very tuned in to what customers want today and what customers are going to want in two years, in four years, and in, in ten years, and. And I do think we have seen these big shifts in customer demand um, based on how how ESG friendly is the product or the service that you're selling. Um, so hopefully companies are seeing the writing on the wall, whether it's good news or bad news. If you if you see this as ESG as being good news for customer demand, well, hopefully you're scaling up your operations. Whereas if you see, I don't know, as an example, you see, look, people aren't going to be <laughs> burning a lot of coal. In, in 20 years, well, you know, hopefully you're planning for that today and already starting to scale down. So ab absolutely, ESG investors can have impact, but but I think customers also have have huge impact on which companies are big, which companies are, are small in our economy. Yeah, thank you. So May, question has come in for you. Uh, you ended your remarks talking about board diversity. What types of diversity should a corporate uh, board strive for? And is it something beyond the demographic characteristics of, of race and gender? I, I do. I think that boards should start uh, thinking about diversity as functional diversity, as thinking about the those holes in the dam we talked about at the beginning. What are the skill sets that we need represented on our board that are not represented at present. And increasingly those are non-market skill sets, skills in CSR and human resources and technology and, and uh, the legal environment, things like this. So once a board uh, highlights those skill sets that it needs, it turns out that when you turn to the non-market pipelines where the people with those skill sets are, they just are more diverse in terms of social uh, identity and demographic diversity than if you just are looking for CEOs or people that have board seats already. And so, you know, once you start thinking about uh, how to expand your functional diversity, you are drawing from pipelines where there's also more demographic diversity. And so I think the two things can really um, uh, bolster each other. Thank you. So as a follow-up to that, May, and I'm going to stick with you, uh, what can women and minority executives who actually aspire to board seats do to prepare themselves and to reinforce their candidacy for consideration? Yeah, I think that as you're as you're if you are aspiring to board service, I think that there's three um, goals that you can make make front and center in your campaign to achieve achieve your own goals. The first is to be informed to understand what, the what problems companies are facing and to be sure that you are you know strengthening your skill sets in areas that speak to those uh, emerging uh, issues and sources of enterprise risk the second is to be visible so to to be sure that you are claiming your expertise and that you are cultivating a a you know a, a, a brand, if you will, that that establishes yourself as a thought leader in that space. And so, you know, you have to use LinkedIn and the the social media tools that we have today to claim your uh, to claim your expertise and to demonstrate it to the world. And the third is to be proactive. That you know, oftentimes when I talk to people about their search for that first board seat, it takes a year or two of really thoughtful cultivation of networks and strengthening of uh, expertise in order to position yourself so that you're in the right place at the right moment when there's a board that has a, 
uh, an opening and is looking for a skill set that you have. Uh, I can tell you that something that we are really excited about here at Wharton is that in a uh, in two weeks, we're going to be launching our first executive education offering, uh, Women on Boards, which is meant to, to check all of these boxes. We're going to be drawing on our uh, fabulous Wharton faculty to, to discuss with our participants the, the cutting edge issues that boards are facing. We're going to be working with the LinkedIn and materials uh, to help uh, folks create a, a director brand and demonstrate it to the field. Uh, and we're going to be cultivating a network, a cohort of women that we hope will support each other uh, as, they, as they go out into the world and achieve those board seats going forward. It's exciting. So, Luke, another question has come in for you. Uh, most boards recommend against shareholder proposals. Is there any incentive for boards to start looking at them more seriously? Yeah, it's a, a good question. It, it gets to the bigger question of um, whom is a, a company serving? Um, I think ultimately, uh, this again is my personal opinion. My opinion is that. Um, companies do serve the shareholders. And uh, it's important to remember that shareholders care about more than just profits. Shareholders also care about things like environment, social, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I'll make it an analogy to a politician. It's, I can rephrase the question this way. Should politicians listen to their voters? Yeah, I mean, of course, politicians should listen to their constituents. So I would argue that, yeah, absolutely, the managers of firms and the boards of firms should listen to shareholders because they serve the shareholders. Uh, shareholders are the people, of course, that elected um, the directors to the board. So I'd argue absolutely uh, boards should listen to their shareholders, including through shareholder proposals. Great. Thank you. So, Brian, what innovative steps from your observation or the work that you you do at Diligent, what innovative steps have been taken by boards to change organizational culture to address some of the internal issues we've seen emerge during the course of this pandemic? For example, the Great Recession and the continued lack of leadership succession options. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think the boards that have had the biggest impact on culture of an organization have found a way to interact with the company um, below the CEO. And I think the traditional view of where a board would play a role would be just connect with the CEO, um, uh, have different people from management come in and do presentations. And what we've seen across our clients is where the board has the potential to have a greater impact on culture is where they dive in a level or two levels deeper. And so it's where um, you have female board members who mentor female executives, not just N minus ones, but N minus two and N minus three. And you actually help to show for those executives, what does a path look like to you becoming a CEO or sitting on a board, et cetera. I think, I think you see that in a big way. Um, that ties to other affinity groups around different organizations. And ultimately, if a board is going to a level, a, couple, a board member is going to a level a couple levels deeper, it's easier for you to find out if there's issues. <laughs> a board meeting, as many folks know, is a highly um, curated experience <laughs> between board members, the CEOs, direct reports, you come in, et cetera. Um, I think an area that has um, been weakened in governance during the pandemic is you miss a lot of those other touch points, the walking to dinner with the management team, the different conversations where you pick up other cues as opposed to someone coming in and presenting their section and moving on. And I think the boards who have had the biggest impact on culture are the ones where, you know, each board member that you have brings their own unique experiences, background, incredible traits. And it's just a huge asset candidly to a CEO um, uh, speaking personally, but should be culturally to an organization to have those individuals work their way deeper. And I think board members would tell you they've, um, it's easier to suss out where there's a cultural issue. It's easier to figure out where to make a change. And then for an organization, it's easier to get exposure to incredibly talented people and hopefully keep and retain your talented people who might not look exactly like the CEO, um, but might look like um, him or her on your board. Um, I think that's where a board can play a really powerful role in helping to shape the culture of an organization. And then, as I mentioned before, the ultimate trump card is the board just changing the CEO 
and bringing in someone who can be a better um, cultural change agent for the organization. Thank you. Uh, May, question, are boards looking at a new regulatory environment where ESG standards become more uniform and the standards will be enforced by the SEC? That is a really hard question to answer. Um, I think, you know, part of the struggle, the kind of uphill climb that ESG is having in establishing itself as a legitimate field that could, you know, have, have standards that were enforceable is that there is right now very little correlation between even the primary um, ESG metrics companies. So if you look at the different organizations that that rate companies ESG, the correlation between the scores that they'll give the same company is very low. So I think there is right now um, not an awful lot of agreement about what metrics are most material and how they should be measured. And um, I, I don't know what the push will be to move the different raters toward a standardized consensus about what the metrics ought to be, but that would be necessary before, certainly before the SEC would be comfortable, you know, enforcing a particular bright line. Great, thank you. So uh, Luke, I think we're gonna make this our last question. What mechanisms could encourage the migration of investments away from non-green companies? For example, should ESG investments carry tax benefits? Oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Should they carry tax benefits? Um, that's probably not the first lever. That's not the first lever I, I would go to. I, I, the lever I would go to first is just let the investors vote with their, their dollars. And um, to the extent that they care about E or to the extent that they care about S or G, let them direct their, their portfolio dollars toward the companies that are aligned with their, their values. That alone, voting with your dollars, tilting your portfolio one direction or another, that's going to change companies' market prices. And that's going to therefore change companies' cost of capital. And that is what's going to help um, reallocate our society's resources toward hopefully uh, more ESG friendly uh, outcomes. I think we should also say that ESG investors alone are not going to save the world, right? I, it's kind of an obvious thing to say, right? But we need a lot more than ESG investors. We also need smart um, rules. We need smart uh, laws on the books. For example, you know, I. I'm like almost every other economist out there, I think we need a carbon tax, right? I don't think ESG investors alone are gonna solve the climate change problem. We also need smart public policy. So I, I think we need a constellation of solutions. ESG investors voting with their dollars is a big part of it, but we also need smart laws on the book. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, May, Luke, and Brian. Our uh conversation today was illuminating and it generated, I think, probably more questions than we certainly have time to answer, but really appreciate your spending some time with us and the perspective that you bring on this important topic. So our final event for the Beyond Business series will be titled Humanizing ESG and takes place on December 7th, and we'll explore how firms can be a positive force in addressing fundamental social cha challenges. Our guests for that session will include Andrew Pe Plepler, Global Head of Environmental, Social, and Governance at Bank of America, John Struer, President and Chief Executive Officer of Calvert Research and Management, and Wilt Witt Heinz, Professor of Management at the Wharton School. I look forward to seeing you all on December 7th. Thank you.